Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage from Pin Screen, Hao Lee. Hi everyone, great to be here. So my name is Hao Lee. I'm uh, the CEO of Pin Screen, a stealth startup company that just got funded. So I'm not going to talk too much about this. Uh, I'm also a professor of computer science at uh, USC, and uh, a lot of the R&D that we're doing there is relevant to both the startup company and a couple of uh, research that we're doing um, very soon. Okay, so um, I work in computer graphics and in the field of computer vision, and the first thing that you think about that is, you know, computer special effects, uh, computer animation. But then the question is, what is actually the future, right? So if we're taking a step back, um, and think about like what people have been dreaming about in graphics uh, back in the 80s. People thought about like you know what if we can actually create an alternate reality, one that actually you know look like um, something that is indistinguishable from reality, right? And um, so the idea is really to replicate something like the holodeck experience, and that's something that's not too far away from it, right? So the reason for that is very obvious, right? So uh, Facebook made the first move. So the First thing is, it's easy to create uh, low-cost, high-quality displays. Each of you have probably one in your pocket. And uh, the second thing is that graphics performance has actually reached a level of fidelity that is unmatched, you know, something that you can actually experience in real time right now, right? So um, basically, the two of these components make it that you can actually experience um, virtual worlds um, in a very... Um, convincing way, right? So low-cost displays, but the question is that we're dealing with in research is all about, is consuming VR content the only thing that we're interested in, right? So um, are we just going to watch 360 movies, or can we also, you know, or only game play games, or can we do something beyond it, right? So if you went to Oculus Connect uh, last summer, uh, they showed an interesting demonstration, right? So basically, a remote multiplayer game where people are in you know, fairly remote locations and can actually have a telepresence as if they were actually there, right? So here you can actually see the obvious problem, which is all these faces don't have any, you know, they don't look like anything. And the second thing is there are no emotions, right? So there's no way you can actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with the other person other than having sound. So what we did in collaboration with Oculus is that we created a demo where the idea is basically to have a sense of telepresence where we can have a face-to-face -face communication with the other party. Right? So I'd like to show you um, how we're getting there. And there are two main important components here. First of all, you like to be in this virtual world as you are. Right? So you want to have a very simple way to capture your digital body. So you want to create, have a way to create virtual avatars. And then the second thing is you want to be able to have an unconstrained way to capture motions, right? So appearance and geometry as well as motions. So let's have a first look at the first thing, human bodies, right? So there's, if you went to the, um, the booths, you can probably see there's a company called uh, Body Labs. So a lot of these things are actually related to that, right? So the state of the art uh, of digitizing someone is to use 3D scanning. There's laser scanners. There's also multi-view, stereo, computer vision algorithms that use a lot of cameras. And by basically just have a synchronized capture using multiple cameras, you can easily rec re recreate a high-quality human body without having an artist in the loop. Right? So what's important is that there's a democratization of these kind of 3D sensing devices. So obviously, with Kinect, Intel RealSense, et cetera. So one of the things that we are dealing with is how can we actually compute using these type of input data. Right? So the input data is basically 3D geometry. And the way you can think about this is just like signal processing. Right? So you have audio processing, you have image processing, and then the third um, stage is basically geometry processing. The input looks something like this, right? So it's basically a surface of a representation of you know, a human body. And you can immediately tell, right? These are human performances. But for the computer, it has absolutely no meaning. It's an unstructured set of point clouds, basically just a lot of XYZ coordinates. But then the question is, how can we actually make this connection to the computer? How can we teach the computer to understand um, the meaning of these um, 
input data, right? So the first thing you can do, and that's what people in um, research usually do, is they do something called model fitting, right? So suppose you have a scan of a person, that's the gray guy, and you also have a model, right? So one of the things that we have developed is basically something called a correspondence computation algorithm, or that is, you know, or an algorithm called non-rigid registration. And what it does is we formulate this as an energy minimization that allows the model to converge onto the scanned input data. So the scanned input data has no meaning, but the green person does, right? So if you warp the green person onto the gray one, you can basically extract all kinds of information, right? So this is basically one of the core techniques that were used actually for building the database for uh, the startup company Body Labs. Okay, so I'd like to show you a couple of other um, applications that we can do if we have the ability to establish correspondences between three-dimensional shapes. So, for instance, uh, if you put a scanner there, right, uh, in my apartment, and uh, the idea here is can we actually digitize an entire human body without much effort, using a low-cost system, without using a turntable or a controlled lighting setting, I'm simply turning myself and exposing new surfaces of my body. And if you throw this entire thing into a um, complex, um, sophisticated numerical optimization system, you can basically extract an entire surface of the human body, right? It's even textured. So one thing you can obviously do is you can have a little 3D printing of your figurine. So that's one thing that we have uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Artec and um, deployed a software called Shapeify.me. But um, obviously, you can also extend this approach to extract a virtual character, right? So you have the surface, you try to compute a skeleton of the surface, and you can obtain a riggable um, 3D character of yourself. So now you can imagine uh, you can have an easy way to have yourself inside a virtual world, right? So let me just show you how it works. So you scan the person uh, using four different views. Um, you compute the skeleton. And every, every step is actually automated, right? So this is a software called SmartBuddy that you can actually um, Google, right? So the person is now rigged and is a you know, movable character. So one thing that's also important for human performances is uh, another application would be free viewpoint videos, right? So if we have a way to establish correspondences, we can also recreate shapes that have no holes, right? So here's an ex uh, a demonstration of um, a state-of-the-art free viewpoint video technique uh, developed by Microsoft, right? So to re recreate this, you need an outside-in capture system. And the idea is to basically use a high-end system consisting of hundreds of cameras, right? So you have 50 cameras capturing the appearance and 50 to capture the geometry. So what we're trying to think about is how can we actually develop something that is deployable, something that uses low-cost hardware and is portable for easy capture, right? Just simply as, um, you know, you can record videos nowadays using your cell phone. We want to think about, like, how can we develop technology so that everyone can actually recreate interesting content. So what we did here was we used um, um, the occipital uh, structural uh, light sensor that is basically attached onto your tablet. We have, like, uh, three or four different people capturing the performance. And what we can do is we can reconstruct dynamic uh, human body performances without having a calibrated setting, right? So the idea is basically you don't have calibrated cameras that are placed uh, inside a studio, but it's handheld, it's calibrating on the fly, and what's remarkable here is that you don't even have alignments between the different scans, right? So the overlap regions are very, very limited. We're also using deep learning to improve texture synthesis, because since you have very sparse views, it's very difficult to actually reconstruct um, plausible textures in occluded regions. Another thing we can do is we can also reconstruct entire human bodies just by having a 2.5D view, right? So if you just have a single depth sensor, the only thing that you can see is basically just the front of the person. But what we can do now, using deep learning, is that we can basically establish the full body correspondences without having the need of any markers, right? So any user in the loop, and it doesn't even drift over time. 
So the obvious application here is that you can obtain a complete human body without having to, um, you know, with just a very limited view. OK, so now we have human bodies. The second problem that the whole talk was motivated by is communication. How can we have a face-to-face -face communication experience in, in VR, right? So if we think about the state of the art for capturing performances is something that you know, is well established in the VFX industry. You place a lot of markers on a person's body, and you're trying to drive a virtual character uh, using the markers, right? So here is a state of the art technique that uh, we developed back at ILM. So, you know, you have basically two cameras, a couple of markers on the subject, and we're trying to recreate a digital, um, a digital um, person of the, of the actor, right? So what we're trying to do is do the opposite way, right? We don't want to have any markers on the subject, and what we like to have is something that works in real time. So you probably know, have heard of the uh, company FaceShift that's using a 3D sensor. So one thing that we have developed right now is basically move this entire system to a technology that only uses RGB cameras, right? So we're using some state-of-the-art machine learning techniques. So let me show you a demonstration. So I'm not using a 3D sensing uh, device. I'm just using the RGB camera here. And one thing I can do is I can just track my face in 3D in real time right now, right? And I can, you know, do other things like uh, probably turning into two monkey, right? So this is the wireframe. All right. So let me go back to the slides. All right. So. The next question is, how can we deploy these kind of things to work in the wild, right? So probably some of you have used uh, so, you know, an app called Snapchat. So you have something called Snapchat Lenses. But you might notice that it won't work if you have your hand in front of your, your face. If you're trying to do virtual makeup, it's impossible to segment what is face and what isn't face if you have hair that is occluding the face. So one technology that we have developed recently is based on deep learning and allows you to actually segment face regions from all the rest, right? And this technology works in real time as well. So you can see a demonstration here where you have a user wearing, you know, a VR device. And what we can do is we can actually track its mouth um, using an external camera and also know what is the face and what isn't the face. So it has nothing to do with VR. It's just like a, you know, a robustness demonstration. But what you'll see here is that he removes the headset, and the algorithm is so robust that it can actually, de it can actually determine what is the face and what isn't the face, right? All right, so going back to VR, the main problem in VR is that you have to wear a huge HMD on your head, right? And you know, what the mouth region is simple. You can actually use an optical system to capture the performance. But whatever is occluded by the HMD is non-trivial. So in collaboration with Oculus, what we developed was a system, a prototype system, that uses a 3D sensor to capture the mouth regions. And anything that is occluded, we're using contact sensors based on something called strain gauges. So strain gauges are basically ultra-thin um, electronic materials that actually release a signal um, if you have surface deformations on your face, right? So here's a live demonstration. And one thing that we can do is we can basically recreate, you know, rough facial expressions in real time while the person is actually wearing the HMD. The whole idea here is actually to have a face-to-face, -face, um, realistic face-to-face -to -face communication in cyberspace. Right? So one thing you can notice here is that you, know, you can't have you know, realistic speech animations because it only re uh, replicates rough facial expressions. And we're going a step further using a new technology. The algorithm here basically consists of you know, having, first of all, a more ergonomic system. So we have a camera that's directly mounted on the HMD. And one thing that we can do is extract, recover highly realistic mouth animations um, simply by placing a camera on the mouth and not tracking it. We're mapping it directly to a synthetic, uh, high-quality digital head model, right? So we use millions of training data, basically, to uh, make the system work. 
And um, again, this is a new um, technology that, that is based on deep learning. So one thing that we want to do is basically have realistic faces, such as this example here, uh, work uh, in VR and to ha e have an easy way basically to recreate those digital models. And the second thing is also to recreate you know, facial expressions as well as speech animation so that we can properly communicate in a VR world. So as you might notice, you know, it's really difficult to recreate things like hair. And hair are important biometric you know, ways to identify each other. So we have, we're probably one of the very few labs in the world who actually have a way to actually scan hair. Right? So hair in computer graphics is a very difficult process. Uh, usually requires a couple of months of modeling time uh, for an artist. So we started off with um, you know, simple capture settings you know, using multiple view, uh, multi-view stereo uh, settings for, uh, as capture. And uh, the kind of uh, output data that we get is basically a point cloud that looks like this. It's very noisy. It doesn't segment what is face and what is hair. But we basically push the technology for digitizing hair to a point where we only need a single photograph and a huge database that actually defines what is here and what isn't here using physical constraints. And we can basically <clears throat> recreate high quality hair models from a single image. Right? So the idea here is basically to define using physical simulation um, what is a hair strand. But that also prevents us to recreate very difficult hair, such as braids. So to recreate hair with braids, we basically borrowed some ideas from braid theory to um, exhaustively generate you know, different combinations of braid patches. And those can be actually used to recreate high quality um, hair models from a single image as well. Right? All right, so this is what uh, the future is like. Right? So we need to build new interfaces um, using these type of digitization techniques. Uh, we are interested in new ways to communicate with each other. And I think one of the most important thing is that if we have the ability to actually build a system that can actually recognize facial expressions, that can actually recognize the appearance of someone, it's actually one step further to artificial intelligence. Right? So from a visual standpoint. All right. So thank you very much. Um, if we have time for any questions, we can, you can also ask me offline. <laughs>